this is going to be the Wi-Fi fundamentals for the green industry. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, highlighting things you should know about Wi-Fi when it in regards to the green industry. Now we have a lot to go over, so hang tight, and I will be answering questions throughout the webinar. So if you have questions, drop them into the question box in your Go to Webinar drop-down menu that appears on your screen, or if you're on your mobile phone, go ahead and type it in there in the box as well. Uh, we will have several people throughout the conversation, throughout the webinar, able to answer your questions, but we will also come full circle at the end of this and have a Q&A session with some of our panelists. Now, we have a lot of great uh, information that's gonna be distributed, <laughs> that's gonna be presented to us by Kevin Battistoni, uh, but we will also have on the phone call today, Anthony Long, product manager for HydroWise, myself, uh, product training manager for Hunter Industries, Kevin Lewis, uh, sales manager in the Northeast, and um, we're gonna have Kevin and Anthony tackle that Q&A session at the end. And again, I will be answering questions that you type into the box throughout the presentation. So Kevin, are you ready yes, to kick sir. this thing off, man? Uh, I think so, Greg. I, you know, to the start of basically the subject matter we're gonna talk here today, it's nothing pertaining to HydroWise, okay? It's all about issues surrounding HydroWise that are outside of our realm of control. So we're trying to take some ownership for it. Um, when Kevin Lewis and I, we were both out at the factory in the first week of January, and we had a time, a uh, chance to visit with the guys in tech support and chat them up a little bit. And one of the things that we asked, you know, what with HydroWise, what are the issues? What are you getting? Because these guys have a good CRM that we use, so they log all the data. And what was crazy is over 90% of all tech calls on HydroWise are connectivity related, not hardware related, right? So uh, it kind of pointed out a glaring issue that we as a manufacturer and as your partner have to do a better job of upping your skill set in this arena. And that's exactly what this, this whole session's about. Now, just so you don't feel so bad about it, um, again, I'm diving into news publications, looking at different pieces of information. Today, 55% of Americans admit they have difficulty installing smart home devices, okay? So that's a coin flip. When you walk into your customer's house to install a Wi-Fi controller, about half the people know something about Wi-Fi that you don't, maybe, okay? If you're limited in your skill set. So let's take it a step further. 62% of Americans admit, okay, there's probably more, but 62% actually admit to returning unused smart home devices why because they couldn't figure it out right and now smart home smart technology manufacturers say that 70 percent of the material and it's probably higher with us quite honestly when we look at these clocks i don't think we eval every single one that comes back unless there's a breadcrumb trail and that's called an firs report story for another time but 70 percent of the clocks that are of smart home devices that are returned claiming to be defective are actually defect free. Again, what's that mean? 70% of the people couldn't figure out how to get the darn thing installed. Now this information I just shared with you comes from consumer tech, which is another thing I hate reading, but I don't know where else to get the information, right? And you can see on there, the gentleman who wrote the article and the CEO of TechSe, who was also involved in that article. If you don't have the 800 tech number, write it down. Um, there's other publications that I've been diving into like Tech Native, Wired, GeekWire, PC Mag. They're horrible. They're horrible reads. It's But it's valuable information. So I am going to take from that what I found to be valuable, dismiss what's not, and try to package it in a way that everyone here can digest it. So hopefully you got your, uh, you know, you got your cognitive uh, enhancing uh, caffeine and alpha brain and you're ready to roll because we are going deep into the realm of Geekville. In doing this, we anticipate major blowback from the tech community, right? Because these guys love to belittle us. Green industry people, we show up at a commercial site, the IT guy comes in, he starts speaking a language none of us can comprehend and it's for one intent to belittle us, right? So in anticipation, because we're kind of ripping the, the can off of all their secret sauce here today, 
we expect blowback. So to try to mitigate that blow, blowback, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna do the presentation undercover incognito with the disguise, disguised as a tech geek, okay? So hopefully it doesn't cause any red flags. I think this is a good approach. We'll see how it goes, right? And when we get into what we're gonna talk about today, there is a little disclaimer. All the intent, intel that I'm sharing with you today and Kevin and Greg share with you are from situations where guys like Kevin and I look like total idiots in the field trying to figure stuff out. Because let's face it, whether you admit it or not, most of the people listening and most of the people installing Wi-Fi controllers, you pick it up from distribution, you hang it on the wall where the old clock was, you ask the homeowner to identify their network, put in a password, and you cross your freaking fingers and hope it works, right? And we know that based upon those tech support calls, right? 90% connectivity related. So based on that, that's where we've gotten some of this info. In the same disguise, I've befriended and infiltrated some of the tech geek circles, reading their news publications, hanging out with them at the Starbucks and the coffee shops and doing research, right? And so um, I have no formal credential in this area. Sincerity is really my only credential. Um, so let's get rolling. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about language of IoT, and I'm going to give you the terms and words that will help you exude professionalism in your interactions with your customers, right? In addition to that, we're going to take a look at what we call WLAN, okay? WLAN stands for Wireless Local Area Networks, and that is the setup that you're going to walk into in terms of internet and Wi-Fi signal delivery mechanism that's most common in residential applications. And we're gonna take a look at three different flavors of those, okay? In addition to that, we're gonna break down and explain Wi-Fi bandwidth and channels. Also, we're gonna talk about Wi-Fi signal testing, which is mission critical. And everybody listening, or if you're listening to the, to the playback of this, you're gonna walk away with an application, a free application, on your phone that will help you figure all this stuff out before you hang the clock and get yourself in a bad way, call tech support, and they say, dude, you're SOL, right? Finally, we're gonna define Wi-Fi requirements. So you can put this information in your contracts, okay? We only look dumb if we don't point out what we need the homeowners to provide us with so that we can fulfill their desire to have a functioning Wi-Fi irrigation controller. So if we know how to define that in our contract, then it's less of our problem and more of theirs, and you'll be able to speak intelligently about getting them in the right direction of the solutions. And then at the end, we're gonna have a little Q&A session with uh, Lewis and Long, Kevin and Anthony, although I heard Anthony got a little nervous when he heard Kevin was showing up and he hasn't called in quite yet, but Kevin Lewis has no issues taking the whole Q&A on himself. Um, he is a HydroWise and Wi-Fi evangelist, and if he can't answer it, not many others can. So, don't worry, Anthony's here now. We're we're yeah, safe. Yeah. Oh, there he I'll is. Yeah. Now, it, it, now, Anthony, according, it's a quarter after six a.m. in Australia right now. Yeah, it is. All right. How many espressos have you had? Uh, none yet. All right. Well, fire fire up that coffee maker. We're gonna we're gonna put keep you on ice for a few minutes, and then we're gonna throw you into the fire. All right. Beautiful. <laughs> Roger that. Here we go. Okay. So the first term we're gonna talk is SSID. Okay. This is a fancy tech geek way of saying what the heck's the name of your network. Okay. But in using it, it exudes professionalism. The next one we're gonna look at is called RSSI. Stands for received signal strength indicator, which is how tech geeks measure the Wi-Fi signal in terms of signal strength from the access point or router, right? And then ISP, it's just a fancy way of saying, who the heck are you sending a bill? Who, who the heck are you charging your cable bill to every month? Who's your cable provider? Who's bringing it into your house, right? That's all that means, internet service provider. WPA. Wi-Fi protected access, okay? There are two forms of acceptable um, access for us with HydroWise. And all WPA means, and there's a few different derivatives of it, is that you have to put a password in to get onto the network, right? And as you know, if you've hung a clock, that's part of the deal with most residents. 
The other one is called OAN, Open Access Network. This means no password protected. Now, people get confused with this. When you walk into Target or you walk into Starbucks, okay, and they have free Wi-Fi, that is not a true open access network or like a Hilton Garden Inn, some along those lines. I shouldn't be plugging these guys. They're not, they're not, they're not even contributing. But my point being, open access network means when you walk in a room and you toggle on Wi-Fi on your phone, you're surfing the web right then and there. Because as you know, on the HydroWise hardware interface, there's no spot for a web browser screen. So I learned that lesson the hard way. I don't want you to. So those are two that are important. And then again, Waylon is wireless local area network. Now, I have a competitor of mine down in the St. Louis area, and I listened to a presentation of his, and it was a, it was a great presentation um, where he was speaking about if we devalue the service we provide, our customers will expect it to be inexpensive and devalue it as well. And I think that we do that a lot, right? It's like um, using an example of saying, hey, I, I'm gonna, we need more water over in that corner. It's a little too dry versus talking about the infiltration rate of soil, the application rate of the irrigation product you're using, match precip nozzles, scheduling coefficients, distribution uniformity. When you begin to use these terms in front of your customer, you then look more professional. And it's the same way here. So, you know, like Greg, if Kevin Lewis showed up at your house and you were a homeowner and he was there to install a Wi-Fi clock for you and you answered the door and he said, hey, Greg, Kevin, pleasure to meet you. Hey, I need to know um, who's your ISP, what's your SSID, and where's your irrigation clock located? I need to check your RSSI. You know, we, you probably wouldn't have a clue what he was saying, but would you think you hired the right company to do the job? Yeah, I think I could answer one of those, and that's either in the garage. I know the timer's in there. Other than that, I'm pretty much lost. Yeah, and I mean, and, and I'm a total and complete idiot. So, I mean, that's, but again, embrace these terms. They're going to come up again. There's an opportunity to do a safe screen. All these are saved. You can go back to them. You want to ingrain this stuff in your service text brains. This is, these are, these, and it's not a big list, six acronyms. That's all it is. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about equipment. And for the tech geeks, they're going to look at the top. For all of us green industry pros, we're going to look at the verbiage on the bottom. Okay. So a modem, we all got them, but do we know what they do? Okay. And so a modem, it's just a fancy word for a translator, okay? The modem is taking digital information from the interwebs through your ISP. And I'm gonna use these terms throughout the whole thing because I want that repetition to start to set in for you. And it takes that digital intel, translates it into analog, delivers it in small data packets back and forth, right? So the MO in modem stands for modulation. The DEM in modem stands for demodulation, but we'll, let's just focus on the bottom. It's a translator, taking it from digital, making it analog, okay? The other component that's very common in your Wayland setup is something called a router, okay? We all got them, everybody, you know, but what does a router actually do? We, well, we know it talks, and it is. It's a conversationalist, okay? That's, that's what a router does. It's its job. Its job is to interface with every piece of hardware on your network, right? I grew up in a beauty shop, so it kind of reminded me of my mom. She'd be cutting one person's hair, having a conversation. There were two or three others on standby, and she could talk to them all at the same time, too. Now, what's important to know about these routers, they're not all created equal. Uh, about two years ago, I made the switch from paying a cable provider and switching over to just paying for internet and streaming everything. And I gave myself like a hundred dollar a month raise, right? And while I was on the phone with my cable provider, with the ISP, I asked the young lady, I said, do you provide a modem and a router? Or, or I'm sorry, yeah, do you provide a modem and router? And she said, we do with the modem and you can rent a router. She said, but honey, if you're streaming everything, don't rent our router, it's junk. She goes, go out and buy a good router. And again, I, I think it wasn't that it truly is junk. It is that the technology and the evolution of the routers, the more hardware we have connected to it, the more things is try, is, that are trying to talk to it all at the same time, okay? But that's basically, it's taking the translated data from the modem, 
and turning it into analog data packets and just going back and forth. And I know I'm using techie, nerdy terms. I'm going to try to keep it on a level I can even understand. So if I get away from myself, I'll, I'll bring the plane back down a bit. So here's our first example of what we'll call the WLAN, Wireless Local Area Network. This is example number one and probably the most common, right? I call this one the Batman and Robin. You know, this is, or if you're an SNL fan from way back in the day, this would be your Tan Man Lotion Boy type setup, right? So the modem and the router are linked with a Cat5 cable, and then the globe on the left-hand side is a representation of your ISP, your internet service provider, whether it's Dish Network or you got a hard wire coming in. You know, that's just a good 3,000 foot view of that. This one, very similar, However, this one I'm going to call the combo meal, right? Because the modem and the router coexist as one item, okay? Then broadcasting out. So not only is it translating the data, but it's also directly interfacing. So this is a really talented conversationalist. Third setup, not so common a few years ago. I will tell you, increasing drastically in popularity, probably based upon the price points come down quite a bit in recent times is something we call a mesh network, okay? Mesh network, when I know you, you see those pop up on the screen and you immediately think Wi-Fi booster. I know what that is, Kevin's not that smart. You're right, I'm not that smart, but you're wrong, that's not a Wi-Fi booster, okay? What it is, is called a node. And it's similar with these mesh networks, you have your modem and your main access point, your router, but then the nodes plug into outlets throughout the home. Okay, now no node, like a booster, a booster enhances signal, nodes amplify it. So, and a, a booster actually creates its own SSID, which will be slightly different than the modem itself. But what happens here is in vision with an extender, the information has to travel from your hardware on the left through there, back to the router and to the modem. With a mesh network, it's like the modem and the router are right there all built in to that little node. So anywhere we can plant a node, as long as it can pick up a signal from another node somewhere in that local area network. And then by doing so, it creates an even blanketing throughout of Wi-Fi. So the goal, whether it's an extender or mesh network is to improve our Wi-Fi range. Mesh networks, you know, they started about 300 bucks a few years ago, they were well north of that. But I just, the point of this is I don't want you to freak out when you walk into a house and you're like, oh, this doesn't look like a standard tan man lotion boy or combo meal. So the mesh network growing in popularity. Be aware of it. It's a good system. Uh, now, let's speak to the router, otherwise known in tech term as the access point. Okay. Now, Wi-Fi is not complex. Wi-Fi is radio signal, period. It's that simple. Anybody who's ever played with a walkie-talkie or a radio, that's all a router's doing. That's all Wi-Fi is. It's just radio frequency, but we're sending data packets inside of it. And if your router or your customer's router has been manufactured in the last decade, it's what we call a dual band router, meaning it's broadcasting in two different radio frequencies or two different bandwidths, if we want to use geek terms, right? So 2.4 and 5 are those and anthony did a tremendous job last week kind of explaining the fundamental differences so i in a in two slides i'm going to have him hop back in for that but just make it gospel right now 2.4 is what we need so if you're defining in your contract what your customer must provide you with so that you can execute the job of installing the clock that they hired you to do 2.4 is a must and again if the router is within the last 10 years been produced, it's got the capability. Even if it's not broadcasting both at that point in time, you certainly can, whether it's through calling the ISP or going online, the homeowner themselves and making that adjustment, there's a multitude of different ways. And we'll kind of, I, I hope to chat that up in the Q and A. Five oftentimes is perceived as better, um, but that's not the case. And there's 30 plus Wi-Fi controller manufacturers out there. As Anthony mentioned last week, there's only two pieces of hardware out of those 35 that actually talk on five, and they're in violation of an agreement in doing so. And now I'll, let, I'll let Anthony bring some color to that in a few minutes. So here you have a visual uh, image of 
the Wi-Fi frequencies in the distance that it travels from the router, otherwise known as the access point, right? And so it's just a fact, 2.4 travels three times the distance is five. So all the normal stuff, like your, your Nest thermostat, your Honeywell thermostat, your video doorbell, your Wi-Fi cameras, all that sort of good stuff, standard operating procedure because of the agreement that Anthony will bring some color to, it all talks on 2.4. Good reason for us, a lot of these clocks, hardware rather, we're upgrading now, I'm in, I'm in my geek apparel. A lot of these controllers, hardware, are not located close in proximity to that router. So good luck trying to get it to five. Now five's not better. Five has a faster upload and download speed. So if your kids or you are a gamer, or if you're streaming movies, you got a smart TV, my smart TVs are hooked to the five. Pretty much everything else is on the 2.4, right? So a lot of information, fast upload, fast download, five's the way to go. In our application, take away from this, got to have 2.4 and it goes a heck of a lot further, right? Anthony, you mind stepping in and going a little bit deeper on 2.4 and 5 and also explaining the uh, the nomenclatures at the top of this screen and the differences between those? Yeah, sure. So um, so if, if you're not familiar with what a gigahertz is, so a gigahertz is a method of measuring um, a wireless signal. Okay, so we measure wireless signals, and in in Wi-Fi terms, the the two different types of signals are two are two point four gigahertz and five gigahertz. So as as Kevin said, you know, um, two point four is a is a is a, a longer wave length. So if you think of a wireless signal, it's actually a wave. Okay, and a two point four gigahertz is a longer wave. Now what that means is it's able to penetrate much further and get much greater distance. But if, because it's a longer wave, a lo longer wave, and when I would say that, that that means between the two peaks of the uh, of the signal, it's a long stream. Okay. Now, because it's a long stream, it doesn't mean it can carry very much information. So, five gigahertz, it's got a higher refresh rate. It's a much bigger, fatter wave. If you think of it like that, it's a bigger, bigger. If you think of down the beach, it's bigger surf. Now, it moves a lot more stuff, but it just doesn't move very far. So um, that's the difference that you've got. Now, you, you'll hear all sorts of talk about, um, <clears throat> about um, 802.11 BG and N, and then N and AC. You'll hear all these different terms, okay? All they really refer to is a standard. Now, there's a standard that's actually put out by the wireless, um, uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance and the Wi-Fi Alliance is these companies like Hunter. Anyone who makes a Wi-Fi product is part of a, or generally they should be part of a thing called the Wi-Fi Alliance. And the Wi-Fi Alliance is kind of like the the, the non-law rules on how this stuff should work. And one of the things that they said was, and they're still saying to this day, is that five gigahertz should be the big pipe. That's the pipe that you're going to stream movies on, you're going to play games with. If you want to actually do something that doesn't need a lot of power, doesn't need a lot of internet speed, if you like, then you should put it on the 2.4 gigahertz. And that's that. That's what the industry is saying. So that's why with Hydrawise, we say we connect to the 2.4 gigahertz. Now, most people think, get confused with the 5 gigahertz and 5G. Okay, 5G is the new Telstra or the new telecom uh, data data plans that are coming out. Don't get mixed up with that, all right? 5G is not 5 gigahertz. They're two different things. It's like saying a red car and a blue car. They're different, okay? So, um, so 5 gigahertz is just a speed that comes out of a router. Now, it tends to be high speed and it tends to be not very far it can't its reach is not very far okay so um so awesome. think of you know, 2.4 gigahertz is like a like a marathon runner and five gigahertz is like a sprinter you know he's a big sprinter is a big guy he can carry a lot of stuff but he can't run very far the marathon guy is a thin guy but he can run for a long time right on perfect thank you anthony that was awesome so now that we understand the fundamental differences between 2.4 and five, 
we're going to focus on 2.4 but you know this is the part where you you want to strap on your seatbelt you know tie a rope around you and put it to the to your chair text or call a neighbor if they don't hear from you in an hour tell them to come over pull the fire alarm something went wrong because we're going to get deep all right but i promise you we will land the plane so greg if the questions start rolling in during this segment like we we lost them just tell me tap the brakes i'll slow down you see my tail lights we'll get back on pace okay so within 2.4 there are 11 different independent channels okay and that's what's visually represented on the screen right now okay within those 11 channels there are three that are more highly favorable now it's not to say that you have control over this but like i said i will land the plane you're going to leave with a tool today that will not only be able to identify your customer's wi-fi and whether or not it's 2.4 but you'll know specifically what channel they're on and you could suggest if you see a potential pitfall coming that they navigate to a different channel okay just a suggestion again bringing professionalism and helping you exude that confidence so the three that we want to stay with or suggest to our customers that they gravitate towards are channels one six and eleven the reason being these are the only three channels within the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth of 11 channels that don't overlap with anybody with one another rather because there are three things that can come up that isp internet service providers are not going to tell you um, that could cause problems and you could have the right password you could have a strong signal and it could have nothing to do with your customer's wi-fi but it could be neighboring wi-fi's that are wreaking havoc right so i'm going to get into a couple of uh things here like this slide for example this is a representation of like a normal household, right? So we'll start off on the left-hand side. You got a tablet, of course you have a HydroWise controller, you got your smart TV, gaming system, video doorbell, of course you got your Luxor ZDC, a tablet, a thermostat, and then of course, you know, for those of you that like it, you got your wiretap there in the upper left-hand corner, right? So you got one of those too. Now, what no internet service provider is going to tell you is that every single piece of hardware on your network is like a two-year-old kid in a grocery store having a meltdown right and what i mean by that is they need attention now i'm coming to find out um all these images are of my daughter who's just under two years old currently right and being stay at home right now taking care of charlie she's a handful right and i so i'm i'm the router and every single one of those pieces of hardware wants your attention and they're all vying for it at the same time so this is again going back to suggestiveness if you see that their router is outdated or if they're renting one from the cable provider it's not that you know the, the rule of thumb if your router's five years old replace it if you're renting one replace it and it's not that it diminishes in its ability to interface quickly it's that we as a society are doubling every year in the amount of connected devices at our home so this guy's having to work twice as hard and he wasn't built to work that hard so guess what the new one not at the shelf um can so five years good rule of thumb don't rent them all right and that's the truth you could be paying for the most high speed internet in the world and if you've got a crummy router you you know you're you're really just throwing your money down the toilet you make sure you get a good router. If you don't have a good conversationalist, the tran the guy who's translating, he's left in the mud. Okay, now I now I explain this in detail because here's scenario one. Scenario one is called co-channeling. All right, so I'm gonna paint you a picture, so bear with me. So let's say Anthony Long and Kevin Lewis are neighbors. Okay. Anthony's the yellow circle, that's his house, and Kev's the blue circle. Greg is the contractor. He showed up at Anthony's house. Anthony wants his HydroWise controller installed. The location where he's installing the controller for Anthony happens to be a location where he can also pick up Kevin's Wi Fi signal at the same location. And it just so happens that both of them are on channel number six. Well, you could have the right SSID. You could enter the right password, but something like this, if both homeowners have a lot of hardware 
even though they have different ISPs, Anthony's got AT&T and Kev's got Comcast, makes no difference. One's got a Netgear router, the other one has a Brand X router. They're both broadcasting frequency, the same frequency, the same channel. So areas where that overlaps in terms of coverage, connecting hardware in that area could be troublesome. It's not a guarantee. I've seen the good of it and I've seen the bad. My job is to point out the puddles so you don't step in them, right? So you can identify them. And again, I know we're on shaky ground here, but I you will have a tool in the next 10 minutes that shows you how to identify channels and read signals. So you can see what the neighbor's doing and what the other guy's doing. That's problem number one, co-channeling. Problem number two, or channel congestion, however you want to frame it. Problem number two is what we call channel overlap. If you recall three slides or four slides ago, I said you, you wanna gravitate towards channels one, six, and 11 because they're non-overlapping. Scenario like this, same thing, right? I'll, uh, I'll play contractor today. So um, Kev, Kevin Lewis hired me. He's the blue circle. Anthony Long's the yellow one. Greg's the orangey kind of guy, right? So they're not on the same channel, but Again, the area where I'm mounting the controller, I can read those other two neighbors' Wi-Fi signals, and they happen to be on what we call overlapping channels. And channels that are overlapping with one another can still cause interference, connectivity, and drop-off issues, right? No cable provider is going to tell you that. I got to read the geek wire to tell you that, right? So important to know, not saying it's going to happen, but I had at least a half a dozen calls where I spent hours on the phone and in the field figuring this one out. So I'm I'm bringing it to you guys so it doesn't so you don't have to waste the same amount of time that I did. Okay, those are channel congestion and channel overlap potential issues. The next ones we're going to speak to are other things that omit radio frequencies that can mess with Wi-Fi. And I know everybody on the right there, we've got a microwave, so everybody's got a nuker at their house. Well, guess what? When that SOB is running, it omits radio frequency. And that can jack with your Wi-Fi frequency. On the left, I know everybody's looking at that like it's a rotary phone. What's that? Everybody's scratching their head. That's what we call a cordless phone. For you non-millennial, or for you millennials, that's how we used to communicate before smartphones, okay? And when you're on one of those bad boys and talking, same thing. That's how it communicates back to the base is through radio frequency. And that can mess with Wi-Fi as well, right? Those are the three most, uh, the three biggest things that could mess with your Wi-Fi signal. Now we're gonna speak to a few others. And if you have some background in radio or central control, none of this stuff that I show you here will be a surprise, right? So two killers, brick and stone right? Wi-Fi does not travel well through brick or stone. Tin roofs, and believe it or not, from what I read, and I'm sharing with you the information I've gathered, no former credential, fish tanks. And there is a fifth culprit. Um, everybody wants to pull out a mirror right now. It's us, right? Or in this case, Steve Pallas. And I want to give a big shout out to Steve for co-hosting the previous two, bringing some life to it. Um, thank you very much for that. But Next time you go into a store or you go somewhere where there's free Wi-Fi, right? Take a look on the floor. Chances are you're not going to find a router, right? Because again, human beings knock down Wi-Fi. Where are all the routers in large commercial areas where free Wi-Fi? Up, up in the rafters, right? In the drop ceilings because they can reach a wider brushstroke of area being up out of the way because they're not having to travel through human beings. So those are all factors, right? And I know you're going, Kevin, why did you tell us all of this? Because I don't have a clue as to how we're going to identify it, how we're going to navigate it. That's where we're at now, right? So if this training was conducted as little as a year ago, if it was Kevin Lewis doing it, if it was myself doing it, what we tell you at this point is say, hey, whip out your handy. And that's German for smartphones. So nobody get any ideas there, okay? open up settings, go to Wi-Fi, and I want you to toggle on Wi-Fi. And if you see full bars, you're good to go, right? One bar missing, not too bad. Anything less than that, eh, you're on shaky ground. And I know Android products and Apple products have different quantities of bars, so that can get confusing. And 
depending on if they custom name their network, they might it might not say five or two point four on there. So there you're scratching your head too, going, do I have the right signal? I don't know. I just know I have a good signal or poor. There's a better way, and that's where we're gonna head to right now. Okay. So the way IT professionals interpret Wi-Fi signal is called RSSI. And up until midsummer 2019, when I ran into a guy by the name of Warren White out of St. Louis, who's a home house automation guy, and he took me down and learned me how, um, I thought it stood for really super strong internet. Turns out that's not the case. What it stands for is received signal strength indicator. And there are applications that we're going to load up here in a minute that will read this for you in the IT language, right? So we're going to, we're stepping into geek world. Now, from what I have read and from what I've has been shared with me from industry experts and my personal experiences in the field, RSSI is read in a negative number, okay? And I'm going to use some visual imagery to kind of drive it home here. So the baseline from everything that I read, if you are negative 60 in RSSI, that is a rock solid Wi-Fi signal and you should have no issues with your hardware connecting to the access point okay the closer you get to zero stronger signal right so if it's less than negative 60 like negative 40 negative 50 you're you're sweet sailing no issues the lower the number meaning closer to zero the better you are now the further you get away from negative 60 and i'll just say from personal experience if you're less than negative 70 it's pretty i've had good luck you get beyond that, this is your, you know, your one bar territory, your no bar territory, right? So, Greg, any questions floating in on this? I want to make sure everybody can still see my taillights before we, we get into the app loading. Your timing couldn't be better. We just had a question about how do we uh, check what channel we're currently on. And so you're kind of going over that right now. Yeah, 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 um, right on. But we did yeah. have a question earlier that popped up, and I don't know if you want to save this till the end. Yeah, it but it was end. Uh, I initially, want to it was an issue with connecting a uh, rain sensor to a Hydroize and specifically a Pro HC24 oh. and having to call tech service and have it reset to recognize the rain sensor. Have you Correct. experienced that issue? Can we, uh, can we, I have not personally, but just because we're so, we're so deep in Geekville right now, I want to <laughs> land the plane before we, well, we open up another book. Let's finish this one. And definitely Kevin Lewis and Anthony can answer that better than I could. So we'll hold that one till the end. Perfect. So now it's about the right tools for the job. Now by a show of hands, and I can't see your hands, but how many Apple people do we have out there and how many Android people? And I, I'm not endorsing either one, but if you are an Apple user, the application is called Airport Utility. There's a visual representation of it on the screen. We are gonna start, good news, um, Apple Android, we're going to start with the Apple people because it turns out, and again, this is my personal opinion from experience because I have products in both categories. Um, Android actually wins this one uh, by a by a long shot um, for a couple of reasons. So it's going to take a little longer with you Apple people. So Apple people, pull out your handies and uh, go to your app store right now and download Airport Utility. Okay, that is the app you want to download. And I've got a couple of visual representations because if there's a couple of cavemen out there, knuckle draggers like myself, 85% of learning is visual. I know uh, if my dad wants something new loaded on his phone, he's got to hand it to me. He's still rolling on an iPhone 4. But once it's loaded, he's very efficient with it, right? So there's no judgment here. So the screen on the far left, and I know they're a little busy. I loaded these up last night, but this is how you attempt you go to the app store and download okay so you want to go to that app logo in the middle tap on it and you're going to type in airport utility you can do it with no spaces or you could put a space in it's going to pop up when it pops up go ahead and tap on it um, i already had it downloaded so it's just going to say open it probably now will prompt you for your apple id or a thumbprint to get to that point okay and if you're if you're not there don't worry we're going to keep it going um you can watch this back and you can figure it out or email us once downloaded in the middle it's because it's the most important there's a critical step that you cannot skip that critical step 
is you need to go into the settings on your smartphone, just like the screen's doing right now. And you're gonna scroll on down until you see airport utility, right? When you see airport utility, I want you to tap on it. When you tap on it, scroll down and there'll be something labeled Wi-Fi scanner. Toggle it on. If you skip that step, the app will not work at all. So once that's done, the final piece of the puzzle is opening up that application, hitting Wi-Fi scan, that's in the upper right-hand corner, and when you do it, hit scan. What it's doing now is it's looking, it's a receiver, your phone's a receiver, and it's looking for every Wi-Fi signal it can. And what you can see there is I've identified my home network, that's, um, I've messed with the neighbors, I think I've got a drug runner living next door, so FBI, the other one's called uh, you know ATF surveillance, but it's 2.4. The reason I know that is I could see, I have it in the label in the SSID there, right? But you can see below it says channel four. And if you were paying attention to the last 10 minutes, you know channels one through 11 automatically mean 2.4. No five gigahertz channels are one through 11. So if it's one through 11, you it's a no brainer. You need to know that, right? And I can see my RSSI is negative 43. It's a good RSSI, rock solid connection. The other thing that you can do when you select a network with this app is it'll give you a time lapse of where the RSSI is going, the highs and the lows, the peaks and valleys. So you could leave your handy set right inside the existing controller cabinet, go walk around, do your startup or whatever other upgrades, maybe it's a new install, go through all that, come back and look at a time lapse of where that RSSI has been going, right? So for everybody that thought that was a little bit too fast, Again, you're gonna download Airport Utility. Once downloaded, go to Settings, hit Wi-Fi, Scan, toggle it on so that the background is green. Don't do that, it ain't gonna work, right? After that's done, the screen on the left is the first one that will populate, Wi-Fi Scan, tap it, it's gonna ask you to scan. What you're looking at are all those networks, right, that the phone's reading. So this is an area, if we've got that co-channeling issue or we have that, channel overlap this is how you're able to identify it and bring it up to the customer before you hang the clock and have a problem right so first thing you're going to see ssid start using the term it's the network name next thing rssi signal strength channel one i know it's 2.4 because channels one through 11 are always 2.4 so with the airport utility that's how you know the difference between 2.4 and 5, you can identify the SSID and determine if it's a potent enough signal for your hardware to connect. Sorry, Android people, you've been waiting patiently. Apple people are a little slower. We're going to move to you next. So if you are an Android user, type in to the Google Play Store Wi-Fi Analyzer, and there will be two or three different ones that pop up. Please select the one that visually looks like the screen. Another way to identify it, it has a 4.7 of five-star rating. The next closest is a 3.7. So I want you to have what's the, the most highly rated one and one I use, right? So same Intel, a little prettier, okay? Once it's downloaded, there's no settings to toggle on Wi-Fi scanner or any of that junk. You've got four different looks, okay? The one on the far right, it's what I call like tachometer view, right? It looks like a gas gauge or a tachometer or a speedo. It's giving you that RSSI, but it's also telling you the channel that it's on. And there is a, I'm going to call it what it is. It's a dummy switch. I mean, we know because we're all smart now that channels 1 through 11 are 2.4. Airport utility doesn't have it. Wi-Fi analyzer does. If you just tap on 2.4, all the fives vanish. So you're only looking at networks that'll work. How cool is that, right? So you know that that's your, what I'll call your tachometer view. The other views, there's a rating. This will tell you how congested that channel is. Not bad, right? Pretty cool feature. In addition to that, you have a graph view of the SSIDs, right? All the networks in terms of where they're at in terms of RSSI. So you can do a screenshot if it's subpar, email it, text it to your customer, say, hey, you got a negative 75 RSSI, you're gonna have to amplify, boost, mesh network, and we'll get into that again once we get through this. Or 
here's that time lapse. A little prettier because it gives it to you in a graph. So the time duration is across the bottom in terms of minutes. You can set it at minutes or seconds. And then each one of those lines is a representation of an SSID. So you could see the highs, the peaks, and the valleys of that RSSI, right? Super cool tool. This free, I, today we're playing the long game with you, right? We're not talking HydraWise, we're talking solutions. So we're gonna give you something for free that we couldn't sell you if we wanted to, which will immediately improve your ability to be successful in this arena, right? That's what today is about. So although it's titled HydraWise, um, this is applicable across any connected device. If you guys have been watching the series, globally we're at 25 billion connected devices. In the next five years, we're looking at going as high as 75 billion. So whether you like it or not, and during this you know, shelter, shelter in place, I'm sure there's a couple of Amazon boxes showing up and you're thinking to yourself, you're a normal person, you're like 55% of people have trouble connecting these, right? So now you can look like a stud, right? If you're, um, for your husband, if you're a lady, or for your wife, if you're a guy listening, you know, this is applicable to any connected device and a connected device is defined as anything that interfaces via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So we're clear on that. So now that we're past that, the biggest hurdle that we encounter is where we're trying to mount that clock or replace it is way outside of the range from the access point, right? And it's not our problem, but it is our job to point out the problem and help the customer find a solution. The solution in the most cost-effective solution is something we call a Wi-Fi signal enhancer or Wi-Fi booster, right? There's a couple different terms for it. They all do the same thing. It's a repeater is all it is. It's taking the signal from the access point in the router, picking it up and rebroadcasting it. Now in doing so, it will change the SSID that's on the router just slightly. Some of them are plug and play. I, they range in price from as little as 50 bucks, as high as 150. Even if you're not an Amazon person, use the reviews on there. I've had good luck with the inexpensive ones. I've got a couple at my home. Um, I don't suggest that you run out and start purchasing these and installing them. And I'll give you my reasons for that. But let's talk in terms of a mounting location. So you can tell the customer what they need. They need a Wi-Fi signal enhancer. Okay, that's the geek term. Where do they get it? They can go to Best Buy, they can go to Amazon. What do they cost? 50 to 150 bucks, okay? Then the homeowner is gonna say, where do I put it? You know, where, where does it go? Ideally, to get the maximum amount of signal enhancement, you wanna to suggest to them that they install it in an outlet is it just me, Greg, or does that outlet look scared? Say, outlet's kind of got a look on his face, like, don't plug into me. But anyways. So yeah, plug and play, easy peasy. <laughs> you want to find an outlet halfway between the hardware you're trying to connect and the access point broadcasting the Wi-Fi signal. That's going to give you maximum amount of boost, okay? My fear is if you could put these on your truck, you could install them all day, and you probably won't have a problem. But my fear is that uh, when sports continue, that Floyd Mayweather is going to need some money and Conor McGregor probably spent all his and they're going to they're going to have another pay-per-view, right? And it's going to be the mega fight. And we're all going to buy in because we're idiots. And that's what we do, right? So a week after you install this booster at your customer's house, he's going to be a little fluttered up watching the pay-per-view preliminary fights. He's got, you know, five, six diesels in him at this point. And all of a sudden, bang, internet goes out. Who's getting the first phone call? Comcast, the ISP, or you? I believe it's going to be you because that homeowner is going to go, yep, Greg Rosink was the last guy that jacked with my Wi-Fi, right? So again, speak intelligently about the solutions to boost signal, point them in the proper direction, explain to them installation technique, but it is their job to provide you with an accurate Wi-Fi signal, okay? Don't get in the habit of plugging these in. I just think worst case scenario, and I see Murphy's Law happen all the time. Remember, as hunter reps, you only call Kevin and I when you have a problem. So, you know, we, we have a little bit of, you know, that we're used to just being thrust into situations where we got to figure it out, connect the dots. So that's your signal enhancer 101. Now, I don't know what happened right there. I apologize. I got a little glitch. There we go. So now beyond that, 
there are some different scenarios with these signal enhancers. And this is where, my God, staying up late at night reading these tech magazines. But in theory, because you're going to ask the question, can I use two signal enhancers back to back, communicating with one another, the hardware and the access point? In theory, this will work. However, Tech Geek says it's not advised. It's not advised because they see intermittent drop off in scenarios like this between booster one to booster two or booster two to hardware. So theoretically it will work, but it's not the proper solution and don't suggest that your homeowner does it. Now the opposite side, no problem connecting two signal enhancers directly to an access point to a router, but not in series like this, right? One off, but for our intents and purposes, we're, we would never have something like this because we're trying to get one piece of hardware on that network, okay? Now, to break down on the left hand side you've got a mesh network okay because i know i'm using the same icon for the what we call the node in a mesh network as i am for the signal enhancer again difference signal enhancer is boosting this signal and rebroadcasting mesh network is amplifying so every time you plug in another node it creates a blanket all on that same network same ssid their plug and play, and it's literally every node has the modem and router right there and built in. It's going right to the internet super fast. So different deal. Range 50 bucks. These guys started around 300. They've come down in price a lot. Um, if you got a lot of connected devices at your home, you know, keep this in your hip pocket as a an audible or a pivot at some point and suggest to your customers if they're big wheels, you know. They're doing a Luxor, they're doing a Hydrawise. You just, you know, they ran up a $50,000 ticket and work with you. So they probably already have a, a home house automation guy, but if they don't, don't let them go the, the, the slow route, you know, suggest that mesh network. So in review, we're just gonna go through these geek terms one more time, because you wanna embrace them, you wanna train them, and you wanna begin to use them. And all of the webinars moving forward from this one, tomorrow included, number four, um, we're going to use these lang we're going to use this language. So if you want to, you might not be able to follow us. Or you might need a translator if you don't start to embrace it. So again, SSID, fancy way of saying what's your network name? RSSI is how we measure Wi-Fi signal strength. ISP, who's your cable provider? All right, not rocket science. WPA, password protected network. OAN true open access network no password or browser screen needed wayland wireless local area network right three flavors that are you know primarily you've got your combo or your combo meal modem router one device you got your tan man lotion boy modem router two piece and then you got your mesh network those are the three most common all right now support.hydrawise.com if you don't have that in your browser, on your computer, on your phone, saved to your desktop, please do. You can call tech support during peak season. Those guys are awesome, but you're gonna wait. All the information is here. It's easily accessible for everything you need. So what I would suggest, number one, when you get off this webinar, go to support.hydrawise.com. Type in Wi-Fi specifications, okay? I was at a large university in the Chicagoland area three years ago. I had all the heads of state at the meeting. I created a, a fake HydroWise account just for them, you know, because I was going there to sell it. And they have over 80 controllers on their campus total. And of course, the IT guy walks in 10 minutes late, you know, and he's peacocking, chest is out, you know, he knows he can talk terms nobody else understands, right? And at the time, I didn't understand him either. But I was wise enough to print out this documentation and have it right there on the desk. And so he starts talking a language I don't understand. And all I did was slide the paper across the desk to him. He picked it up, he looked at it and goes, yeah, we can work with this. And I wiped the beads of sweat off of my brow and said, thank God, right? So put this in your contract, You know, make it clear to your customer what you need from them in order for the equipment to work. So get, you know, frame it up properly from the beginning. Um, some people ask about security statement. I just put this in there as an example. You can also find in support.hydrawise.com our security statement, right? So if they want to know about security, here you go.
I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to give it back to Greg. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let the real experts, Lewis and Long, take over. Hold on. Hey, Kevin. Greg, um, we got a few questions here for you. I got to dip out, but uh, Kevin's going to, he's got the questions in front of him and he's going to answer them too. I'm going to start you out with one question though before I take off. And right that is, um, an individual said that his channel, his router is on channel six okay. and all of the other channels have higher star ratings than his. He's getting a one star versus 10 stars on all the other channels. And he wants to know how he's supposed to change that or if he has to buy a new router. No, he, it, it depends. You can, you can, it depends on your router. Um, I have a neck gear. I can change the channels right through an app. Um, you certainly should be able to do that by logging in online to your isp um, i know the local ones around me you can alter it there if you can't you can contact them part of the reason he's seen a low rating too might be because of how much hardware he's got on that line so if everything's working good and there's no lag or delay i'd leave well enough alone um, but that's that's how you would change it Okay, very good. We got another question here uh, from someone that says, installed seven clocks at a big insurance company in our area. We could not connect to any Wi-Fi with a message saying, cannot find uh, access point. What does this mean? Also in one location in the parking garage, they do not have Wi-Fi. Would the booster be the solution? Yeah, no. No, the easiest way to handle that is really get uh, go down to your, to your telecommunications company, AT&T or Verizon, and get a hotspot. Um, we don't like connecting to super secure networks. So, uh, so when you're talking about a, a bank, um, an insurance company, um, some sort of uh, uh, schools, universities, we don't really like connecting to those networks. Um, what happens if, if Hydrawise connects to, that, to those networks? It, it makes us a higher security threat. So it means that uh, what that means is more hackers are going to want to try and hack into us. So from our point of view, go and get a hotspot, a portable hotspot. Uh, they're a little small device. Uh, just looking for one now. Yeah, that's, that's a portable hotspot. Okay. It's a little thing. You connect it up to a power supply and that's going to get you a connect to the internet via the cell network. Okay, so via your telecommunication company. It's super cheap. It's going to cost you about 10 bucks a month. So, um, you know, and they're certainly plans much cheaper than that. So uh, that's going to get it. You don't have to connect to their network. It's a much, much better deal for everyone. Okay, I think we got one more here. Try to airport utility and two networks showed up with channel six. One is mine, not sure about the other. Is that an issue that they are both on channel six? Not necessarily, not a guarantee that it's an issue by any means. Um, it potentially could be if you're trying to install a new piece of hardware where both Wi-Fi from this channel six and Wi-Fi from this channel six are overlapping in the location where you want to install that hardware. So you, everybody on the whole block could all be on channel six, as long as we're not trying to install something on Anthony Long's Wi-Fi network that is also in a spot where Kevin Lewis's Wi-Fi network is overlapping. Does that make sense? It does. I, yeah. Can you change that channel? Yeah. Yeah. You you absolutely you absolutely could. And again, it's it's either going to be a function of doing it at your router or through your internet service provider. Um, I could do it through an app on my phone, or I can do it online through my cable provider. Or if you're totally, you know, if your homeowner is having a lot of trouble, tell them to call their cable provider. Yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah, the other thing too, be, be aware that the ISPs will help out. You know, the ISPs are, or the internet service providers, you know, they are really keen to help you. And, and you know, they, they will most importantly try and help that customer. And uh, they often send out free components and, and free Wi-Fi boosters and all sorts of stuff. So make sure you're getting, getting them in the loop as well. Okay. Yeah, the other thing to um, keep in mind is the, uh, the use to, to switch over to a phone's hotspot just to do a quick kind of identify whether the issue is on a network side or on the phone side. It's, it's kind of difficult for guys that are used to using their hands yeah. and shovels and tools their whole life to uh, reach for their cell phone uh, 
uh, as a tool to kind of identify a network problem. But um, it's definitely a quick way to to take it off the controller side and put it on the network side. Yeah, yeah. So just to elaborate on that a little bit further, you know, if you are having a problem with the homeowner's network, try connecting it to your phone. If you can connect it to your phone, you know, you've got it on your phone. You know that their signal is a problem because it works on your phone. If it works on your phone and the controller is working fine via your phone, then you know it's their network problem. And that's when it becomes their problem and not your problem. Now, obviously, you've got to help them out and through that process. But the key is get them to ring their internet service provider. Um, you know, we've got a lot of information that ISPs um, uh, might be able to use to, to try and make that, that solution a bit better for them. Uh, the other thing is if it's a specific company and a specific router that, that has caused problems before and we've been able to identify it, we will have done a support document on it. So at support.hydrowise.com, um, you'll find uh, different articles on, the, on specific routers. I know we've got one for Verizon, for example. Uh, that's a specific router that, that caused some issues and we've actually done a support document that tells you how to fix that particular router or set up that router so the hydrolyze will work. Okay. Good stuff. And we'll we'll get deeper specifically on this topic of hotspots and troubleshooting in a later webinar. But um, great questions. Got any others, Kev? Uh, I think that's all. I think Greg uh, did a good job of answering them as they were coming in. I think that's yeah. all we got. Awesome. So with that being said, we're going to sign off and we thank you again for your business, your support. Stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.